Our speaker this morning uh, is well known to virtually all of us here, certainly to any golfer like myself has been looking at Bernard Langer uh, for 25, 30 years, and it's a real privilege. He hardly needs an introduction. Um, however, when I was doing it, just looking over his uh, accomplishments, it really is extraordinary to me. He's, um, his record as an international champion is, is rapidly becoming unparalleled. He's uh, turned professional in 1976, and in that career, he's had 84 professional victories. He has two green jackets from his master's victories at Augusta, has 15 victories on the championship tour. 1986, he was ranked the number one golfer in the world, and on the championships tour, he's been named player of the year in 2008, 2009, and 2010. We're fortunate enough that Bernard is a neighbor of ours. He lives nearby in Boca Raton with his wife, Vicky. Been married for 28 years, has four children. And um, I just learned that they were all homeschooled. God bless her for doing that. And we're looking forward to hearing from you, Bernard, to share your unique experiences, including your personal relationship with God and how that's shaped your life. Please welcome Bernard Langer. Thank you very much. Good morning to everyone. Thanks for getting up early and spending this time with us. I know you could be doing other stuff. And I just want you to know that uh, with the message I have to share is so important to me. I don't get paid for this. So your whatever $25 or whatever for breakfast goes somewhere else. Uh, and I, I got up at 5 o'clock this morning to be here uh, and spend some time with you. So it's, it's that important to me because it's been life changing and I've seen many other people's lives changed. But uh, Tony already said so much, there's not a whole lot to add anymore, uh, except uh, give you a little bit of background. I grew up in a small town called Anhausen, which is about 30 miles from Munich in Germany. My father was a bricklayer, my mother was a housewife, and I was the youngest of three children. And in those days, we were pretty poor. At the age of eight, I started to caddy to earn some money. And we were paid five marks, Deutsche marks, which was about $2 at the time uh, for a round of 18 holes. The golf course was five miles away, so we used bicycles uh, to get there and back. And we were given four old clubs from a member who discarded them and all the caddies had to share them, and there were about 12 of us. So those four clubs were a two wood, a three iron, a seven iron, and a putter with a bent shaft. And maybe that's where all my putting problems came from. In the early days, early years of my life, I grew up in a religious home. I attended church on a regular basis, um, assisted in my church's worship service, as an altar boy for seven years. I always believed in God and was very religious, but I never knew that I could have a personal relationship with God. And by being religious, I mean I tried to keep the rules, like going to church on Sundays, going to confession as often as possible, and all those other things. And uh, most of these rules are good, but according to the Bible, they will not get you into heaven. I was taught that if I did a lot of good works, it would get me into heaven. But the Bible says in John 3.16, 3, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, the Bible says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. At the age of 15, I finished school and had decided what I wanted to do with my future. So I went to the Institute of Job Placement, and when I was asked what I was interested in and what I wanted to do, I replied, I want to be a golf professional. And the person who interviewed me said that he had never heard of that before. <laughs> he left the room to see if he could find any documents on such a profession. After about three minutes, he came back with a ruffled look on his face and said, there's no such thing as a golf professional, and he would strongly advise me to do something else. 
And here I was, 15 years old, with my parents on my side, trying to convince them that this was my great future. And the guy basically said, just uh, learn something decent, uh, forget that. But I knew that there were about 200 golf professionals in Germany at the time, and they all made a living. So I was able to convince my parents that this was all that I wanted to do, and they finally gave in. And one month later, in August of 1972, I started my first job as an assistant pro in Munich Country Club. And my first tournament as an assistant pro, in fact, in my life, as I was never an amateur, I was just caddy playing a little bit of golf, came a few months later at our club in Munich. Uh, 25 of the best German pros traveled to this 36-hole event. I was still 15 years old, and none of the other guys had ever heard or met me before. To make a long story short, I won the event and surprised everyone. And when I was 17, I won the National German Close Championship in a playoff with two others and became the youngest winner of that event. One Sunday morning, I had arranged for a game with three gamblers at our club. As usual, I came half hour early to hit some balls on the range and warm up. And the weirdest thing happened to me. I always start hitting wedges first and work my way up. Well, this morning, I shanked every single ball out of that bucket. And I made my way over to the first tee with shaking knees, knowing how much these guys would play for. And we ended up playing for what I considered a lot of money. The amount was about my income of three months. And with my horrendous warm-up, I didn't feel very confident. The only good thing was that the first hole was a par five, so the first two shots were with woods, and we all know you can't shank woods. There's no hosel there. So as it turned out, I shot 68 that day and took all three of them to the cleaners. I remember when I was 16 years old and Jack Nicholas came to our club. And I was actually invited to play in this exhibition match with, with Jack and two leading amateurs from Germany. I was going to play against Jack Nicholas, the greatest player who's ever lived. I was extremely nervous and had very little experience with tournament golf. On the third hole, I shanked an eight iron, which was really embarrassing in front of my members. On the fifth hole, I pull hooked the three iron and hit a lady on the shoulder and the ball bounced back onto the green instead of going into some bushes. So I apologized and thanked her for the favorable bounce before I went on to hold the eagle putt. At the end of the round, the German reporter asked Jack what he thought of his three playing partners. And he said, well, the two amateurs had excellent techniques and showed a lot of promise, while the young pro had a lot of talent and guts, but he had a long way to go. So when I finished my apprenticeship and got my diploma as a head professional, I was 18 years old and decided to try my luck on the European tour for a couple of years. And until then, no German pro had ever had any kind of success on any tour. And I really didn't know what to expect and what kind of competition I would be facing. I bought a little Ford and drove 2,000 miles to Spain and Portugal, where the first stop of the 1976 European tour would be. And I immediately developed the dreaded yips. Yips is an uncontrollable and involuntary movement of the muscles, and it has destroyed many professional careers, such as golfers and surgeons. I believe there were several reasons for it. I was used to very slow greens in Germany, and the greens in Spain and Portugal were lightning fast. I wanted to prove to everybody out there at home and mostly to myself that I was good enough and I just put too much pressure on myself. I didn't have much money, I wanted to succeed quickly. The first two to three years were pretty rough and the problems with my putting didn't help. The only thing that kept me going was the knowledge that I was a very good ball striker and if I could only improve my putting and my short game, I would be one of the best. In 1978, I still had putting problems and on one occasion in a match play tournament, I four putted from three feet. I was sometimes double hitting it 
And my opponents would not even give me a one-foot putt because they could see that the chance I would miss it was probably as big as I would make it. These were extremely difficult and trying times. There were many times when I asked God, why me? What have I done to deserve this? There were also some days when I thought about quitting and going back to teaching golf. The breakthrough came the following year when I won the World Championship under 25 years of age by a record 17 strokes. I made every putt I looked at and it was as if a heavy load fell off my shoulders. Two years later in 81, I won the money list in Europe and no one ever thought a German could do that. Oh yes, we have good soccer players, great tennis stars, super skiers, but golf, no way. In 82, I played a tournament in England and on the 17th hole, I hit a nine iron for my second shot. I pulled it to the left of the green and it hit a big oak tree. I heard the ball hit two or three times up in the tree, but I didn't see it come down. So seconds later, hundreds of spectators started laughing and sure enough, the ball was lodged up in that tree about 18 feet above the ground in a little indentation on a huge branch. After debating whether I should take the penalty shot and drop it or climb up in the tree and hit it, I decided to climb up the oak tree. So minutes later, I hit the ball from up in the tree onto the green. The crowd went absolutely crazy. The TV cameras had everything on tape. And hours later, the pictures of me hitting the ball out of the tree went around the world. Two days later, I flew to Akron, Ohio to play in the World Series Golf Tournament. I was co-leader after three rounds, and I heard the people in the crowd saying, there's the guy who was up in the tree. They knew I could climb like Tarzan, but I obviously didn't know my name at that point. 1984 was a great year for me. The second most important event of my life occurred in January. In 1983, I had met and began dating a girl by the name of Vicky, and she's from Louisiana. And on January 20th, she became my wife. That was the beginning of many great things. By the end of that year, I had won the money list again in Europe and finished second in the British Open at St. Andrews. I also played eight events on the U.S. tour and won enough money to receive my tour card for the following year. So now we're into 85, my first year as a member of the U.S. tour, and I won the biggest event in my career so far, the U.S. Masters in Augusta, Georgia, one of the four Grand Slam events. Then the very next week, I also won the Heritage Classic in Hilton Head. I went on to win the Australian Masters, the Casio World Open in Japan, the Sun City Million Dollar event in South Africa, and two events in Europe. That year, I won seven tournaments on five different continents. I was ranked number one in the world. I had a beautiful young wife and had achieved everything I could have ever dreamed of. The problem was there was still something missing. And as I analyzed it, it was easy with a lifestyle like mine to get wrapped up in money, houses, cars, world rankings, US tour, European tour, the money lists, and so on. 